What's up, guys? Let's communications. Welcome to my review of Fletch Lives. Now, I find this to be a... I'd say it's underrated. I'd say, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's an, just as enjoyable as the first film. In terms of quality, it's not as good. Um, I can agree with critics in that way, because it is a little bit more silly at points. I find some of the jokes don't really work. Uh, the whole stuff of Cleveland Little, him being like a slave... In, in the 20th century, I thought it was just kind of weird. It really, I, I didn't really care for that angle. Um, some kind of cringe-inducing moments of the whole thing where he's trying to make out with a girl, and she's like, I've got to go, I've got to pee, or something like that. You're like, okay. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's an enjoyable, fun flick. There, there was, in some ways, it was a little bit better than the first one. There were actually a little bit in terms of action. There was a little bit more memorable action. There was a really fun uh, motorcycle chase with some great stunts near the end, um, with uh, Randall Tex Cobb chasing after him. Uh, there was some, I would say, in terms of funny, in terms of you know hilariousness, it's just about as, as funny as the first Fletch. I don't see how you could like the first film and not like Fletch Lives. I think it's just as funny. It's it's really hilarious. There's some great laugh, a lot of hilarious moments. And this score right here, you know, you can hear in the background by Harold Faltermeyer, he did a little updated version of the Fletch theme, which sadly, this is actually a recreation by a YouTuber, and sadly, this is never available officially. Um, but I, I do like the, the little, uh, re, you know, recreation of the theme by Harold Faltermeyer. Now, Fletch lives, I don't think it was a sequel that really... I mean, Michael Ritchie came back to direct, and that really helped. But the film really received a very negative reception, and it holds a 31% rating of Rotten Tomatoes, which I find a little way too low. I really do. I don't think it's that awful. Um, although there were eight sequels and prequels written by Gregory McDonald that could have been used for a base of a second Fletch movie uh, at the time, Universal decided to write a completely new story. Uh... So, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of trivia. I find this film to be one of the best films when it comes to making fun of the whole uh, evangelist preacher stuff. Uh, how ridiculously over the top a lot of this evangelist preacher stuff on television was. And uh, I'll, I'll just play an audio clip as soon as this uh, uh, soundtrack clip is done playing here. Uh, because I find it, you know, I thought it really funny uh, where he's playing Fred Smoot. You know, Claude, he's playing Claude Henry Smoot, you know, the, the guest healer. Anyway, the film, Chevy Chase comes back as Erwin Fletch, Fletcher, and uh, Hal Holbrook also joins the cast as uh, Hamilton Ham Johnson, who turns out to be the villain. Becky Culpepper is played by Julianne Phillips, who's uh, a newcomer. I thought she was pretty, she was pretty, pretty, pretty. She was, just, she was, a, she was a pretty girl. Um, her acting was, eh. Not the best in the world. She honestly, she reminded me of the chick from Fort Fairland in some ways. Uh, her performance wasn't as of a dumb bimbo, but you know, she she wasn't as cute, so to say, as uh, uh, Dana Wheeler Nicholson. Um, so you have uh, Arlie Ermey is also in it. It's Jimmy Lee Farnsworth. He does a fantastic job as this preacher who's got a little bit overboard. And he has his own TV studio, and he has his own theme park. There's even a joke where he's like talking about, you know, and then the flesh like, do, do you think I have a little, you know, a little bit overboard on, you know, my face all over these things, you know? And he's all like, of course, the flesh is all like, um, no, no, you know, work for the Ayatollah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, you also have uh, um, Cleveland Little. Uh, from uh, Blazing Saddles is Calculus and Entropy. The kind of char the character is basically a slave. I mean, I, and, you know, ultimately you find out he's an FBI agent undercover, um, which was really a surprise. Uh, and then you, you also have uh, uh, Richard Belzer in a little bit of a role. Randall Tex Cobb is Ben Dover. I had, I had fun with his character. Richard Libertini comes back as Frank Walker, Fletch's boss. And uh, Phil Hartman has a little bit of a, a cameo. There's not a lot of trivia about the film. Um, 
critics didn't like it, and I, I just I don't see how it's that awful. That's the thing. I will come to bat. I will come to defend this movie. It's funny. It's a funny movie. Yes, it's a little bit more silly and uh, fantasy and in, in in a fantastical in a way than the first film. It's not as gritty, um, but it still has some hilariously funny moments. And Chevy Chase, I didn't agree with the critics who said that he just acted like he was phoning in and being lazy, and there wasn't a lot of energy, you know, compared in comparison to the first movie. I'm like Fletch's character in Chevy Chase's comedy is is pretty much deadpan. So he doesn't need he doesn't he's not full of energy. It's not like Chevy Chase is Jim Carrey. So I, I don't understand the criticisms of his performance. And also, for the longest time you could not get this in widescreen. So uh so I'm glad I was able to get this copy. But for the longest time you could not get this movie in widescreen to say you know, to, if if you try. You couldn't get it. So, you know, so you had to end up, you know, ending up dealing with some uh full screen piece of crap. So and Universal didn't even treat the film well on DVD when it first came out. It was really poor quality. Um, and it wasn't as as big of a smash hit as the first film, but it was made in an eight million dollar budget and it made the thirty nine million dollars. So I don't know if that's just a US total, but that's that's a decent amount of money. Anyway, I'm gonna play the Crazy Preacher uh, audio clip. I would I would have played the actual shown the actual clip but, you know, copyrights and whatever I might even get a claim just for this audio. But anyway, uh, just listen to this. I mean, I cannot laugh at this. Is that you? Come on down, Skip Bob. Raise speed. Hallelujah. God bless. Amen. Praise the Lord be saved. Well, Kim Bob, welcome. God bless you. Jim Bob. How long have you had these headaches? About five, ten minutes. God help him! <laughs> <laughs> and how do you feel now? Well, it's a throbbing. Well, God bless you. A throbbing headache comes right up through your heels, up through the hip bone, the knee bone, up the spine, up through your back, through your head, like Satan was belching through his head. <laughs> exactly. Do you believe? I believe. He believes. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Man, New Year, all oh, good, God, God and Miss Molly. Molly. How do you feel, son? <laughs> the headache is gone. But God bless him. Is there anything else I can do for you? No, no. Good <laughs> God bless you. Praise be. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Well, Jimmy Lee, I was, I was, uh, on, on my gazebo, on the roof, making some repairs, and I, I was struck by lightning. <laughs> That's when he talks about his, uh, how he got his powers, and I'll get into that later. But anyway, that, I, I just find that hilarious. It's totally, and I've been to churches, I've seen that, the whole, I've been, I've even experienced that, the whole thing where the priest goes and is like, you are healed, be healed, you know, and I'm slain in the spirit and everything, and, and it's just it's just so ridiculous, and the movie just nails it. It just absolutely does a fantastic job satirizing how ridiculous all this you know the evangelism craze was in 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 the uh, in the eighties and on TV and everything. It just it just does an absolutely fantastic job with that. <laughs> I was like, you know, oh hallelujah, God bless you, <laughs> you know, it's like you know, and I just love the whole movie. It's like, oh good God, I miss my. <laughs> Um, heal this man from these headache demons, these migraine headaches. So anyway, uh, that's a little bit. I'll get into more quotes later. Um, yeah, it was directed by Michael. Michael Ritchie came back to direct the film, and I thought he did an equally good as good job as he did in the in the first movie. And basically, just the plot is you have Erwin Fletch. Fletcher, Chevy Chase, is a reporter for the LA Times, is contacted by the executor of his late aunt's will, attorney Amanda aunt Ray Ross, played by Patricia Calember, and Ross informs Fletch that he has inherited his late aunt's mansion in an 80-acre plantation property, Belle Isle in Thubadou, Thibodeau, Louisiana. And upon arriving in Louisiana, you know, he has some fantasies. What he does, he ends up quitting his job. He ends up quitting his job. He ends up, like, bluffing off the, the alimony guy. And I remember in a quote that I, I really like, but they didn't show it. 
and I can't find the full quote online, but the, the movie even opens up with him undercover, like a drag, trying to figure out some sort of thing going on with these uh, uh, Greek guys. There's these Greek, uh, 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 one of them is played by Richard Belzer. He plays Peggy Lee Zorba. There's a scene where some guy tries to hit on her, hit on him, and he's like, oh, I'm not that kind of girl, or something like that. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty weird. See, it's, it's, it's Chevy Chase's drag. And uh, he, he's, he has, like, gray hair. It's some older maid, or an older woman who's, who's a maid, I guess, for the mob or some shit. Uh, but anyway, he gets out of that, and he ends up going back to, to you know, his job at LA, in L.A. And he finds out he's going to inherit this mansion. So he thinks it's this beautiful, great mansion, and he can just quit his job. So he buffs off his boss. You know, insults him, goes up to the alimony guy and tells him, insults him, you know, you know what, you know, you got a bald spot going up up here, you know, maybe you should uh, take a uh, transplant some hair, the hair from your ass up there. Maybe it might make you smarter. <laughs> and, and then, you know, then he just ends up heading over, you know, dreaming. He has a great, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when he's daydreaming. And he, 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 you know, he daydreams and he's at this beautiful mansion and, and, you know, he's, he's dressed up like this, uh, the Colonel, the, uh, nice, uh, not so nice Southern, not so Southern gentleman. And he's, he's got, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's totally a fantasy. He's like, give me some sweet tea, you know, then that's the whole thing where you have him and there's like cartoon characters and he starts singing, zippity doo da zippity day. My, oh my, what a wonderful day. Da, 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 da. Zippity doo da, wonderful day. <laughs> there's like birds, and there's a bluebird on my shoulder. It's totally just a total uh, parody of the Song of the South uh, sequence, and I, I crack up. I love that. It's one of, one of my favorite fantasy sort of dream sequences in movies. I love that. And of course, he ends up going to Bell Isle and realizes that it's a piece of shit. It's not what he what he dreamed it was. Of course, he finds that the mansion is completely dilapidated, but nonetheless agrees to buy it, buy it, to, you know, agrees to keep on its caretaker, to keep it, um, you know, uh, so he can help out Calculus and Trophy, played by Cleveland Little. And Fletch has dinner with Ross at her at her home that evening, and she tells him of the, of the two hundred twenty five thousand dollar bid for Bell Isle made by an anonymous buyer. They're sleeping with Ross. Fletch awakens the next morning to find her dead. <laughs> that's not what you. That's not what you. That, trust me. Like when you go out with some chick, the last thing you want to want to see in the morning is her just laying there, you know, face first, dead, on your bed on the bed. You're like, oh man, what did I do? Did I? Did I? Did I fuck her brains out so hard? Did I literally fuck her brains out? Oh no! Um, and that kind of reminds. Me, there's a, a sort of similar sort of scene in uh, Clean and Sober, Michael Keaton, but that's more of a serious movie. And uh, Fletch is in charge of Ross's murder and taken into custody, uh, nearly being raped by the zoophilic necrophilac cell mag cellmate played by Ben Dover, played by Randall Tex Cobb. I love this whole scene where he's all like, "Take your pants off." I don't even know your name. Bend over. Ben, nice to meet you. Victor Hugo. <laughs> and he's like, what are you in for? Molesting a dead horse. Well, I can't see I can't see what's so wrong with that. Did the horse object? <laughs> and then he's like wearing like makeup and things like that. He's got like eyeliner on and eyeshadow. And I loved it because it was like it was sort of like the opposite of what you expect, like the prison bitch sort of thing, stereotype. No, you know. He he's maybe wearing makeup and stuff, but you're his bitch. It's not this not it, it's the other way around. And it was great to see Randall Tex Cobb because I, I really I I've always liked Randall Tex Cobb and he was great in this. He's Ben Dover. <laughs> like what's your name, Ben Dover? <laughs> and he's spared only because Dover is released on bail. Dover's lawyer Hamilton Ham Johnson, played by Hal Holbrook, is able to get Fletch released as well. When Fletch declines a second, even larger offer for Belle Isle from the buyer, this time presented by realtor Becky Culpepper, played by Julianne Phillips, uh, he starts getting harassed each night at the mansion. First by a hired group of bumbling Ku Klux Klan men, Klansmen, who <laughs> messed up. And I love this whole sort of scene where they're all like, you know, it's not like it used to be. I didn't find it here. KKK leader is like, folks ain't home. Cross won't burn. Hell, it ain't like it used to be. And he actually makes a... I love this scene. This is never mentioned on any of the quotes. 
but it's I find it so hilarious. He just starts yelling random stuff and uh, to the KKK guys, and he's like, uh, Gene Hackman! <laughs> he just randomly just goes and it says Gene Hackman. I, I, you know, and I was like, that's great, because it's like Mississippi burning, burning game out a year before. And that was, Gene Hackman was so great in that, dealing with the KKK. I love that. It was like, oh, Gene Hackman will come. Uh, this is, it randomly bursts out Gene Hackman, literally. And I can't find the, the full quote, and I wish I could, but I really love that quote. I find it great. And, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I can find, uh. Um, maybe I can find it. I'll find a movie, a streaming copy of the movie, and then just try to find that quote. Because I, I really like that quote. Because I'm a huge fan of Gene Hackman, and I thought it was great. And no one talks about that scene, that specific, specific moment in the film. Good. Um... Okay, I did find a streaming copy, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just try to find that one scene and just play the audio. So bear with me. I just want to make sure I get it right. You know, I really like that scene. There's a lot of great scenes in this. That aren't, the quotes aren't available online. There's a lot of great quotes in this movie. Okay. Try to find that scene. Excuse me, just bear with me here. I'm trying to find that scene. This KKK scene here. That's it. He just he just grabs a megaphone, and then he's just like, Zulu, Zulu, Gene Hackman kick your ass. <laughs> Come on, that's that's awesome. I I had to find that because I just had to. Come on, I had to do that. Um, that's that's that was one of my favorite scenes from the movie. So I'm just a huge Gene Hackman fan. So yeah, I love I like I really like that scene. And that quote's nowhere on, on, on the on IMDb or anywhere on the internet, so I just wanted to make sure to get it right, you know. Zulu, Zulu, Zulu. Gene Hackman kicked your ass. I love that whole scene. It, it's racist, it's bad, it's horrible, it's like making a joke out of the KKK, but you know, that was a fun scene in Blazing Saddles as well, and I, I really think that was a funny scene. There's a lot of good funny scenes in this movie. So anyway, 
they have the group of Pomo and Kluko's clansmen. They don't, you know, they don't end up doing much. And then they have an arsonist who burns the man's mansion down. And then he gets uh, harassed by Dover, who tries to kill Fletch during a raccoon hunt with some locals. And Fletch discovers the land on Belle Isle to be polluted by toxic waste and sets out to uncover the identity of the anonymous buyer, whom he suspects is attempting to intimidate him into selling. He learns that local megachurch, Farms with Ministries, is interested in obtaining the Belle Isle property. Fletch investigates the church pastor, televangelist Jimmy Lee Farnsworth, Barnsworth, played by Arlie Ermey, and discovers Farnsworth's daughter is Becky, the realtor who represents the buyer. The toxic chemicals in the soil of Belle Isle is traced by back to Bly Bio, a to toxic chemical waste facility in Mississippi. Fletch obtains an invoice from the plant's manager, proving Ham J Ham Johnson ordered the waste dumped on Belle Isle Island. And he figures this out in a really fun scene, where he goes over, you know, to the to the um, to the uh, to the place, you know, where the toxic, you know, Bly goes to Bly, and there's a guard that meets him. We see Fletch walk by an all-white suit with a limp. He's like, "This is a secure area." Well, I'm very happy for you. Most people live in terrible neighborhoods. You the head honcho? That's right, sir. Henley Dan Duke. What appears to be your problem? Problem is, I agreed to take a shitload of that bluebird crap off your hands, and it ain't come yet. I'm very sorry, sir, and you are... I are pissed! Some damn fool told me I was on back order, and I'd have to wait. Whose signature is this? Whose signature is this? Who signed that? Well, I can't seem to, uh... Well, that's the trouble. It's typical of a large corporation. Lack of communication. That's why I like to keep Everest small. Oh, you're from Everest? Now you're talking... Elmer Gantry. Elmer Fudd Gantry. Well, Mr. Gantry, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not sure there's anything I can do. Uh, well, you could pull my file instead of standing there pulling your pud. Pull the Everest file. <laughs> Apologize for my beneficiosity. I've had a hernia operation. Is that the stuff I was supposed to get? Yes, sir. Why are they wearing those funny suits? Well, they're protective, as you know, and it's very gross a byproduct they're handling. Oh, yeah. I guess if they didn't wear their suits, those boys would be so full of holes they whistle when they walk. <laughs> oh, oh. What's that? Oh, I've been spitting up blood, pissing blood, bleeding. Go through five of these suits a day. Well, it seems you have your facts wrong, Mr. Gantry. Your company's supposed to get 1,500 gallons. Destination someplace called Belle Isle, Louisiana. Signed for by an officer of your company and do the, th do the 23rd. So we're right and you're wrong. Let me see that. Takes a big man to admit he's, when he's wrong. And I am not a big man. <laughs> so, uh, I, I enjoyed that scene. That's a fun scene as well. And, um, so he figures that out, you know, from that scene. And the guy he was uh, talking to on that, on that that scene is uh, Phil Hartman. And, uh, so then Fletch confronts Ham with the evidence at a costume party fundraiser hosted by Ham at his home. At his home. And Ham admits he polluted Belle Isle out of revenge for the way he feels Farnsworth took advantage of Ham's mother shortly before she died. Farnsworth persuaded her in a confused mental state to give away her valuable land on which the church built a profitable amusement park. Ham intended to devalue the land owned by Farnsworth Ministries and killed Ross when she found out what, she, what, he, what he was doing. Becky is captured by Dover and brought to Ham's mansion and Ham orders Dover to kill her and Fletch. Fletcher creates a distraction by spilling out the urn containing Ham's mother's ashes, and he and Becky escape. They flee to Farms Ministries Church nearby, interrupting a televised church service in progress. Ham arrives shortly after, intending to kill Fletch, but is shot by calculus. I like the whole thing where he's like, you know, you wouldn't shoot me on national television, would you? Yeah, is it? yeah, I would. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, afterwards, calculus reveals himself to be an FBI agent. Uh, Special Agent Goldstein, working as a part of an investigation of Farnsworth Ministries' financial dealings. Back in Los Angeles, Becky Fletch is thrown out of, from a welcome home party by his co-workers and receives a $100,000 insurance check claim for the mansion fire. His ex-wife's alimony lawyer, Melvin G Gillette, George Weiner, whom Fletch despises, shows up offering to forego all first future alimony payments in exchange for the Belle Isle property, which he believes to be valuable. Fletch, barely able to contain his joy, happily signs over the worthless polluted land. And that's that's the end of Fletch Lives, pretty much. And there's there's some other scenes I didn't mention, like the really fun motorcycle chase with the sidecar, with uh, uh, Randall Cobb chase and his biker gang chasing him. 
and just fun quotes like uh you know more of the narration stuff he's talking about a computer he's like all i needed now was a computer and a 10 year old kid to teach me how to use it <laughs> and then the whole thing where you have uh uh, Farns was asked and Fletch, you know, he's like, Erwin, admit that you are a sinner. Uh, well, I've sinned. I didn't take any Polaroids or anything, but yeah, I've sinned. And uh, he's like, Lord forgives you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Amen? Amen. What? Other sins? Uh, I parked in a handicap spot on my way up here. Actually, on a handicap person. I told him I'd be back in five minutes, so that's not much of a big deal. <laughs> And, uh, like the whole, uh, sort of, goes with the whole, uh, I like the one where he's talking about, you know, uh, he's narrating some more. He's like, figure out the guy who dropped my watch in the swamp was the same guy who stole it at the more. It didn't really take, didn't take Sherlock Holmes. Larry Holmes could have figured that one out. And, uh, I love this scene where he's at the biker bar. He's dressed as a nerdy businessman, as, uh, Ed Harley. And he's all like, name's Ed Harley. Name's Ed. Ed Harlan. Ed, you sure you're in the right place? I think so. I think so. <laughs> Ed, what are you doing in here? I'll give you a hint. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You don't, you don't get it? No, Ed. You're the one that doesn't get it. Ed Harley. Harley Davidson Motorcycles. You own the company? Well, my granddaddy started it, and then my great my daddy screwed Davidson out of his half, and now I own the whole thing. Harley Davidson, oh shit, no shit, hey everybody, Ed the Third here owns Harley Davidson, with the Nazis from Nazis. <laughs> I like the whole thing where he goes into this guy, he, this guy on the computer, he's trying to get him to figure out some more stuff about the ministry, and he's like Bobby Ross, and the man on computer is like, huh? Peter Lemongill, your house is on fire. What? They called you and told me. They called and told me to tell you your house is on fire. I'm here to take over. Well, God bless you. <laughs> then he runs out of the computer room and then Fletch, as the man is leaving, he's like, "God bless you for believing that shit." <laughs> Love that. God bless you for believing that shit. <laughs> and then the whole sort of stuff where that, the one stuff I didn't mind is the stuff when he's dealing with uh, calculus and he's talking about calculus. I didn't really care for that character, but I didn't mind the sort of uh, dialogue he and uh, uh, Chevy Chase had. It's like, how do you have to calculus? Like, how do you do? I'd be calculus and trophy. And you be Mr. and Mrs. Fletcher? I'd be Fletch, geometry Fletch, and she'd be Miss Tr Trigonometry Ross. <laughs> and calculus is our families go back for hundreds of years, and your great grandparents owned my, owned my great grandparents, and that's how it all started. You ever heard of the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, I heard something about it, but I don't recall exactly. Didn't get too much publicity around these here parts. All bet. <laughs> There's more more with calculus. Should I be doing anything? No, not really. Um, uh, as soon as you get that truck upstairs and have finished and uh, finished your nap, I guess you could fix that step and jump down, turn around, pick a bale of cotton. And while I'm gone, see to it that Miss Scarlet stays away from the Union Army, will you? <laughs> and then there's more, you know, fun stuff. Where he's he's talking about, uh, you are, I'm Claude Henry Carlton Smoot. Ca -ca -ca Claude Henry Ca Carl? Claude or Carl? Carl Smoot. Smoot. S M M O T T. I'm sorry, two O's, one T. Smoot. I'm a guest healer. A guest healer. Heal! <laughs> and uh, that's a fun quote. And then I'm trying to see if there's any more missed here. Oh yeah, the one scene, I, I really like this scene where he's, uh, pretty much what he's doing is he's trying to get some information and he grabs this one guy. This one guy, he, uh, he, it's play, I think it's played by the same actor who was in, uh, uh, Lockup, I believe. I believe it's the same actor. And, um, this character, he's like a cop, I believe. And he's trying to get some information from this guy. And so he comes in and impersonates a uh, bug, uh, an exterminator. 
Uh, he calls himself Billy Jean King. You can see there. And it's pretty much uh, it's pretty much his mechanic character, playing mechanic character. Uh, another version of that. I'm just making sure, uh, checking to see if it is the same actor. Um, Jordan Lund. I'm trying to see if it's the same actor, Jordan Lund. Yeah, it is. He played the deputy sheriff. Yeah. The same year he was in Lock Up as Manly, this asshole security guard. He was in uh, Fletch Lives. And I'm going to see if I can find that clip so I can just, you know, play the audio. Because once again, that clip, which is, I thought was hilarious, because what he does is he has to, he, he, he talks about these, uh, these bugs that multiply, you know, they, they, they breed by masturbation. <laughs> And uh, and uh, they're like invisible. And they're really like microscopic. And um, and he tells him like he drops one in the guy's ear, and then he's all like, "Only way to get rid of it is like smack your head." You know, here it is, microscopic termites. I'm just I'm just gonna play the audio. Sorry, excuse the thank you very okay, much. Go. Couldn't find that light switch myself. What the hell are you doing here? It's a restricted area. Didn't you see the sign? Sign? Signs? That's all I see is sign. Look at this. Stressed out garments on the windows, walls that are declining to an alarming degree. Declining? This house is obviously infested with reticularis mariacomas. Well, what's that? What's what? Well, re reticulars. See, you can't even say it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they are deadly African microscopic termites. You can eat a hundred times their weight in five minutes. Much like yourself, from the look of things, I'd say, oh, well, this place is about ready to collapse. Who are you? Billy Jean King, Bug Buster. My van's parked out front. Oh, Mr. King, I don't know nothing about no bug busters. Well, the Surgeon General is right. They've been mighty busy here. The only time you can catch them is at night. Aha! I got one. See that? Ah, these little buggers are the piranhas of the insect world. The only thing they like better than wood is human flesh. Really? You bet. Well, if you can't see it, how do you know you got one? Oh, well, I'm glad I asked that question. They make this horrible, high-pitched noise. It's kind of like a, 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 a tiny little scream. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Uh, it's like a tiny little piglet. Uh, no? Let me see. Uh-oh. Uh, seemed to have dropped it in your ear. <laughs> Better get that. Can't let that nest in there. They 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 they, they multiply by. They multiply by masturbation. The only way to get that out is to get as close to the floor as you can. Going down, down to the floor. That's right. They, they, yeah, they're drawn to the floorboard. Now now shake your head like you're trying to get the water out of your ear. That's good. It's no harder. Oh, this side. Oh, I wish I could show it to you. Right. Literally. He's now make that swing. Man, he's got a draw. So yeah, that that's that's one of my favorite clips from the movie too. I thought that was hilarious. So um yeah, that's that's pretty much Fletch Lives. Um not as many funny uh lines or as memorable lines as the first film. There's a good amount of them though. It's still a really entertaining fun flick. I still think it's incredibly underrated though. I think it's a little bit of a step down from the first movie, but not a very big step down like a lot of people seem to think it is. Um I still think it's a very solid sequel. One of the most underrated sequels because I I, I enjoy I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was never bored. I think some of the uh, like I said some of the adventurous sort of action sequences were better than the first film. Um, I still laugh my ass off the stuff with the the ministry um, satire was great. The whole scene I just showed the played the audio from with the the uh, exterminator I love you know you, you know they're they're attracted to the floorboards or get down there on your hands and knees and oh wait get out I was like smack your head like you're trying to get water out of your ears and squeal like a pig and they're like ah 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 <laughs> I, I just, it's just it's great seeing that it's a great you know sort of it's a definitely harkening back to the Deliverance but it's it's great to see that character that actor Manly was such a fucking asshole in lockup. Having to get you know basically getting his getting his justice hurts in this movie. 
But overall, I mean, I didn't. I don't agree with critics. Uh, I agree with critics that said this is great fun on the back here. Said it was great fun. I agree with that. It's a very fun, entertaining sequel that I really don't think deserves a lot of the hate that it gets. I think it's incredibly underrated. Uh, Chevy Chase is a great, and I could probably argue this is his last great movie that he was in. Because what he did, what did he do later in the '90s? A lot of pieces of crap. So I would say that that Fletch Lives is at least one of his was one of his last truly great comedies, and he was in his element. I, people say I heard him in an interview say he just kind of half-assed it. If he did, he did a great job. Uh, regardless, I'd love to see what he did, what he would have done with this film if he was, you know, going all out. I think having the same director as the first film helped. It adds a lot of continuity, and it feels has the same vibe as the first movie. Same thing having Harold Faltermeyer do the soundtrack. Uh, it was it was fun seeing how Holbrook play a bad guy. I think he pulled it off. Arlie Ermey was great as as the evangelist. I'd say the love interest wasn't as good because Michelle Phillips. I really don't think is as good of an actress as the girl in the first movie, uh, Nicholson. And uh, but Chevy Chase is is bringing it. He was hilarious, uh, just like he was in the first film. I, I don't see how bad this movie is. I don't understand the hate that this movie gets. I think it's incredibly underrated. I think it was well written. The, the mystery wasn't as involving as the first one, but it was still interesting enough to keep me involved in the movie. Uh, the only thing is that you know, I have a problem with is the love interest. Uh, some of the jokes don't work, just like the first movie, but mainly it's the love interest and the whole slavery angle with Calculus Entropy. I, I, there were some fun lines of dialogue between him and, and uh, Chevy, but overall I could totally do without that angle. And it was nice seeing Cleveland, nice seeing Cleveland Little again in a movie, but it can't, that's a little bit too offensive for my taste, especially 1989, to have a movie pretty much about the joke that slavery is a joke. I didn't really like that. It's really hard to really look at slavery as being a joke. It's not funny. And this movie was trying to pray, and use that as a joke, and I, I just didn't like that aspect of the film. It was offensive. And the first movie wasn't really like that. It didn't do that. It didn't go to that extreme. But other than that, I still think it's a really solid movie. Yes, there's some offensive, racist-ass bullshit in this movie, but it's still an enjoyable, fun flick. With, you know, definitely, uh, if you like Fletch, you should enjoy Fletch Lives. I really love the, the motorcycle chase scene. See the picture there? I don't know if you can see it very well, the picture right there with him with the helmet and the motorcycle, you know, on the motorcycle with the chick. Right on the back. And, um... Yeah, uh, Randall Tex Cobb was great to see him. If you're a fan of Randall, T Randall Tex Cobb, you should definitely check this one out. He has a fun, really fun scene. I think I remember. I, I'm trying to remember the whole scene. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. I think I, I he was watching a movie. Yeah, I love it. This this scene was great. And they don't have this on the quotes either. And he's all like, "Your Fletch is bugging him." It's like, you know, it was like nobody bugged me while I'm watching the Terminator. I'm gonna kick their ass or something like that. <laughs> That's pretty much. I'm watching the Terminator. Nobody bugged me. Nobody give me any shit. I watched the Terminator. That's not that's not the exact line of dialogue, but it was a great line. It was a great line, great scene though. It's like I'm watching the Terminator. You know, maybe 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 this one is on here. I'm trying to maybe 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 in the morgue, sneaking into the morgue clip, they might have it. I'm trying to see if it might be in here. You got a name? Oh here, yeah, it is here. Please. It is here. Okay, I'm going to play the audio. This is one of the last audio clips I'm going to play. You got a tag, it's Joe. You got a name? Eldridge Cleaver. Take him in the back, strip him. Hold him. Let's see what Mr. Cleaver has. Or should I say had. Stole Fletch's watch. Fletch is trying to get into the... Shouldn't I get that? Tell you what, I'll make you do. I like this scene. You call me whenever you want. I'll tell you what time it is. Now get moving. <laughs> you call me. You know what? If you call me when. You know, I'll tell you. Get this sticking out. Look at golf kid. Hey! You got a tag? It's tough. Yeah, so yeah, he was watching the Terminator there, so that he didn't have the line of dialogue in that clip. But you did get the fun moment with Randall Tex Cobb telling, "I'll tell you." <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, Tex Cobb is great as usual in, the, in this, and yeah, I, I just I really enjoy Fletch Lives. I really had a lot of fun with the sequel. I had some problems, yes, with the whole racist angle and the girlfriend wasn't as strong. 
But overall, still a really entertaining, fun sequel that does not deserve half the crap that it gets. This is not an awful movie. I'm sorry. I don't know how we can watch this movie as a fan of the first movie and be like, this is terrible. Um, but anyway, I really don't know what to say about Fletcher. It was a rate out of five stars. I'm going to give it four out of five. I still give the first one four and a half. I'm going to give this one a four out of five. I really enjoy this film. I find it really highly underrated and a um, few problems here and there, but they're not enough to really knock the film down. Well, the, the slavery joke doesn't work and the, and the girlfriend isn't as strong. So what, you know, that, that knocks it down a half a star for me. It's still a really solid sequel and really entertaining. And a lot of fun. And does not deserve an, an, as much crap as it gets. And I, I think if you haven't seen it or if you didn't like it originally, give it another chance. I think it's a film that um, maybe people had way too high expectations for. I don't know. But either way, I, I still think that it's an incredibly underrated movie. And I'm gonna, I, I sound like a broken record, but I really do feel that way about Fletch Lives. Because nobody talks about this movie. And whenever you hear reviews, it's just like, this movie sucks. It's like one of Chevy Chase's worst. And even Chevy Chase himself bashed it. And I'm sorry, man. Chevy, this is a hell of a lot better than Man in the House or Cops and Robertsons. I want to hear you bash those movies instead. Because they deserve it. But anyway, thanks for watching my review of Fletch Lives. And I will see you guys later. See ya.